All right, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you so much for sticking with us as we enter our seventh session of this conference. And we're going to be looking at actionable climate science and information for the Caribbean. And so this, se this session allows us to take a look at some of the work that has been going on in the Climate Studies Group MONA as well as the Alternative Energy Group in the Department of Physics. Allow me to acknowledge before we proceed, Anaiti Mills, Inter-American Development Bank, one of our sponsors, thank you so much for joining us. And just to say, our sponsor for this session and the earlier climate sessions, for, so for the entire afternoon, is the Caribbean Development Bank. Could we put our hands together as we acknowledge our sponsors and we say a big thank you. So to start us off, we're going to look at a paper that examines the impact of climate change. And so we have a paper using generalized linear mixed modeling to project faunal abundance in a Caribbean dry forest under climate change. We're going to invite Kimberly Stevenson to present this paper. Let's put our hands together for Kim as we welcome her to present on this. Fantastic. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, my project, as Dr. Stevenson said, was looking at using um, generalized linear mixed modeling to project faunal abundance in specifically the Helsher Hills. So the background of the project, basically why we needed to do this. Um, as you heard from Prof. Taylor earlier, the Caribbean in general is very climate sensitive. And that doesn't only apply to the systems that human use, it also applies to our biodiversity. Um, the issue is, in the Caribbean region and in Jamaica as well, there is a lack of data for pretty much anything you want to assess. So whether that's historical climate or historical abundance of organisms, there is usually going to be a lack of data. And that's the issue that we're trying to address. How do we assess the climate sensitivity of specifically um, animal populations, even if we don't have in a lot of data to work with? So that was what we were trying to address. The goal of the project in general was to model this sort of small scale system that has a lack of data. So this is an outline of how this, this presentation is going to go, but we're just going to jump right into it. So the site that we used was the Helsha Hills. Now the Helsha Hills, and you'll see a picture of it here. The Helsha Hills is a very well preserved dry forest um, on the southern coast of Jamaica. And one thing that makes it unique is you'll see, is this the pointer? You'll see the red spot here, the red star here. That is where the Hilsha Hills, um, the dry forest of the Hilsha Hills is. It's a limestone forest. Um, it's, it's a karst limestone um, terrain. So it, the limestone has a lot of holes in it, essentially, and very little soil. And so the vegetation there is used to very hot conditions, very dry conditions, very little soil. Um, and it's located, again, in this very dry section of Jamaica, which will be explained further by Ms. Walters later on. Now, it's very close to the Norman Manley International Airport, which is here, and that will be relevant later on. But the Helsha Hills is a very ecologically important site because many organisms are found there that are found nowhere else in the world. Things like the blue-tailed gollywasp, um, the Jamaican iguana, things that are probably only found in Helsha alone. So the data that we were working with, first of all, we had abundance data of 22 either species or families um, running and data running from 1997 to 2013. 17 of those were arthropod groups and for those non-biologists in here, that means primarily insects, things like beetles, things like centipedes, um, spiders and so on. And five lizard species. Um, the climate data that we had was also sparse. So a weather station was set up in the Helsha Hills in 2010, and we had data, climate data from 2010 to 2012. The weather station recorded rainfall, temperature, relative humidity. There were also two soil moisture sensors that were installed, um, again, for a very short time period. 
But in the climate data that we assessed for Hellshaw, we assessed that entire period, that entire two year period, two to three years, and we also assessed or estimated extreme indices for that period as well. And these extreme indices would be things like um, maximum five day rainfall, um, the maximum temperature per day, and so on. So getting into model creation then, the point of the model, as I said, was to use climate data to project abundance of animals. Now, in order for us to build a climate, a bioclimatic model, as we call it, we had to somehow synthesize a longer time series for our climate data. So how we did that was that we took those two to three years of Hellshire data that we had, and we identified a proxy weather station, which was at Norman Manley, and that was the longest running, most comprehensive weather station that was closest to Helsha Hills. And so we used what we called generalized additive mixed modeling to establish then that whether or not that proxy could work for Helsha. And so by finding a proxy, we had a longer climate data set in order to build the, um, the model. So what we did essentially was we fed in uh, the, we found the relationships between the climate data that we had and the species abundance. And we found the relationships of these species amongst each other. And what we were trying to identify is what are the predictors of each of these species abundances over, over time. So once we identified these relationships, we fed them into a predator selection um, system, essentially that used generalized linear modeling. Um, and that is essentially a regressive technique. So you're using regressions to find out what things are related to each other. But that was just in order to find the basic subset of predictors for each organism, essentially. We fed them then into our generalized linear mixed modeling. And the reason that we did that was that the GLMM is more robust. And so that takes into account both fixed effects and random effects. So um, the prediction then of, or the, the changes in the abundance of these organisms due to the treatments that we apply to the system versus the changes due to just regular variability in the environment. So all of that is taken into account by this more robust mechanism. So we identified a general set of predictors first for each organism, and then we fed it into this more robust system to actually identify the actual predictors to, to boil down the subset of predictors and identify equations then that would be able to project or predict um, what these organisms would look like into the future. And then once we got those equations, we used them to build a final Helsha Hills species model um, and to actually make projections towards the end of the century. So another thing that's not mentioned here is that the end of century climate data that we used for was from the regional climate model PRECI, which will be discussed by Jayaka Campbell later on again. But the point that is we got data from 2071 to 2100 in order to make the projections of what the abundance of these organisms would change like into the future. So a few things about the model then. We wanted to make a model that only needed climate data as input. So if you have abundance for particular organisms in the present day, there is no way that you can then go out there and just look at these organisms and identify what numbers you will have in 2100. So the idea is because we know that we can, we do have stable systems of, of projecting what climate will look like into the future, if we could use just that climate data and still be able to accurately represent what the abundance would be like in the future, not only would we have a simple system of modeling these organisms, but we could also identify the conservation needs that they would have based on changes in climate. The other thing is we were assuming no feedback in the system. So predictor led to predictand and that was it. We did not expect that the predictand would then feed back into the predictor. The other thing is we constrained everything to zero because clearly you can't have negative 17 organisms, right? Right, okay. So we also validated the model. So the validation of the model would already be happening in this generalized linear mixed modeling system another reason we chose it because it allows that self-validation so whatever we end up with we know has already been somewhat validated but we also validated using independent data sets and um, uh, 
function called SP Timer. So just to run through the historical climatology of Hilsha very quickly, it basically follows the, a similar pattern to what the rest of the island follows, except that it's much hotter and it's much drier. So on your left, you will see the climatology of rainfall. So that's basically the mean monthly rainfall that is obtained in Helsha. So annually, we get about 1,382 millimeters of rainfall. Most rainfall is during the Octo oct October to sept September period. Um, and temperature, of course, is highest during the summer. Um, this set of graphs here was just basically showing you that Norman Manley is actually a decent predictor for, or a, uh, a good proxy for Helsha Hills data. So based on the generalized um, additive mixed modeling that we did, based on correlations, based on just every method that we could possibly use, um, we identified that Norman Manley does actually um, align well with Helsha, and so the patterns are very similar, and the um, climatologies are very similar. So we decided then to use Norman Manley data in order to build the model. And in the future, we would pr use the, do the projections based on Hellscher data. Now, for those people who are, who are going to ask why we didn't include things like the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation and El Nino and so on, the first reason is that the influence of all of these large-scale oscillations that you would normally hear about would be taken into account in the patterns of variability of the climate data that we have for temperature and for rainfall, which we also proved. The second thing is modeling of these large-scale systems is not that accurate at the moment, at least modeling of them into the future. And we wanted to keep as much accuracy as possible. So just to show you what we ended up with as the Helsha Hills future climate for 2071 to 2099, we identified that for rainfall, we would lose under our best case scenario, there would be about 23% less rainfall throughout the year and 40% less rainfall under a worst case scenario. And this graph is just showing that BS means baseline, so what we're having now, A2 is our worst case scenario and B2 is our best case scenario. So you'll see there that the blue line is the highest. So no matter what we get after this is going to be less rainfall. Green line is in the middle and red line is the lowest. So we get the least rainfall under the worst case scenario. And for temperatures, temperatures are highest under the worst case scenario. But in the future, temperatures will rise in Hellshire Hills. And under the best case scenario, that will be by almost three degrees. And under a worst case scenario, about four degrees. So three to four degrees of temperature rise in the future in Helsha Hills. And we've already been talking, right, so we should, we should get into the model creation. So we've already been talking about the impacts that one degree can have. So we, if we're expecting up to four degrees, then we could have a problem. Now this is the final Helsha Hills model that we came up with. Again, we had 22 species. Using the generalized mixed modeling, the generalized linear mixed modeling, we were able to come up with, with equations for 20 of those 22. So we realized then that sparse data did not um, negate the ability of finding essentially a model for these species. Now we, put, we use this little schematic to show that the arrows represent where the predictors are and they move towards what they're predicting. So most species were able to be predicted with just either rainfall or temperature and a few species needed um, other organisms to predict them. Now, another thing to note is that we did not assume that it means a Nolis lineatopus is eating the solpugids, so, or the lizards are eating the solpugids. That's not what we assumed. Um, we assumed that in some cases that might be uh, the case, there might be a predator-prey interaction, but in some cases there may also be a situation where two species just need similar conditions, and that's perfectly fine. Um, the relationships were also not found to be perfectly linear. The other thing we found is that there is a stronger influence of rainfall on almost all organisms. So under the, moving to the results of the model, under the A2 scenario, the worst case scenario, there was less change in abundance in these species overall. Um, there was a stronger change actually seen in the best case scenario. We still don't have a full explanation for that. Um, but the point is, under both scenarios, there was a decrease in the majority of species. 
The other thing that we noticed is, again, the organisms were highly sensitive to changes in rainfall under both scenarios. So in both scenarios, the organisms that decreased, decreased because they were predicted by rainfall. Um, so ultimately, using our methods, we were able to identify a strong climatology for the Helsha Hills region, even though there was sparse data for the area. We were able to obtain models for almost all the species that we identified or that we focused on, even though, again, there was a sparse data situation. Um, and the model skill was reasonable based on our, va our validation techniques, which I didn't quite show, but just trust me. Um, but the final thing to focus on then is there is an increase in the range of variability in the climate variables. And there is an associated increase in the range of variability in the biodiversity. So of course, there will be some organisms that will like these changes. For example, things like stink bugs. Stink bugs really like hot, dry conditions. So if we have hotter, drier conditions, we might have more stink bugs, um, which could be good for some people. But for other organisms, things like most of our lizards, hot, dry conditions are not favorable. And so we will have to basically cater or conservation techniques then to protecting both these sets of organisms. How do we then protect the things that do like these conditions and the things that don't like these conditions? And as Dr. Schlossner said before, even though these organisms are used to hot, dry conditions, it doesn't mean that they will easily adapt to hotter, drier conditions. So we will need to protect them. Um, finally, basically, we can produce a simple model that can accurately project abundance of organisms despite a lack of data. We can actually do this. Um, and modeling these systems, again, enables us to establish what the climate risk to these organisms will be, um, especially in a situation where we are trying to limit the amount of change that we're seeing in these environments. And that is it. Thank you very much. to do a similar kind of study? What kind of location? Um, I oh, sorry. Oh. Well, if we're looking at the, at the Jamaican context, the next step reasonably would be to see if an entirely different kind of ecosystem would, able, would be modeled in a similar way. So we used a very dry, um, a dry limestone forest. Ideally, we would try somewhere like cockpit country or the Blue Mountains to see if the method would still work even though it's wetter conditions that will likely vary in different ways. That would be the ideal next step. Thank you very much, Dr. Stevenson. Our next paper looks at the El Nino Southern Oscillation Phase and Tropical North Atlantic Sea Surface Temperature Anomalies on Wet Season Onset Dates in the Eastern Caribbean. I'm going to invite Mr. Sheldon Grant to do this presentation. So I prepared a 20-minute presentation. I was just informed <laughs> that it's now a 15-minute presentation. <laughs> so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So the topic is there. It was read to you earlier. So do I need to repeat it? No. Good. So let's get into it. <laughs> so seasonal rainfall forecasting scale was assessed and will be discussed in this uh, paper. Also, we're going to explain how we define the beginning of the wet season for the Eastern Caribbean, and basically characterize ENSO, and I'll elaborate more on that, and establish a relationship with ENSO and the wet season onset dates. Now, a little background. So a couple of papers from Taylor, Jury, Spence, and others would have alluded to ENSO having some sort of influence on rainfall in the Caribbean. 
whether to suppress it during an El Nino or to enhance it in an El Nino plus one years. Now, for other papers in China and India, they looked at models, created models that could predict the start of the wet season for that region. So it has been done, and we're going to do it. Other papers now would have also attempted to define the wet season and what we constitute as rainfall season. Because in a general sense, we just say when we have abundance of rainfall, that's a wet season. We want to actually define it in a more robust sense. Now, the rationale, we have an absence of predicting wet season onset date within the Caribbean. And also, it will assist in seasonal forecasting skill. And also, having knowledge will start, the, having a knowledge of the start of the wet season will help in planning. And you know, you don't want critics to say, oh, we're macaroni ago. We didn't get it right. Good? So, seasonal rainfall forecasts. At the beginning of the research, we found out that the season April, May, June, AMJ, and May, June, July, MJJ, had low skill. So if you were to make a guess and say, why, well, if you said it will be above normal, you probably would have done a better job than the actual skill. So going forward, we hope to characterize ENSO in terms of the rate of change. So in the past, person would have said we have a strong El Nino or a weak El Nino or a weak La Nino or a strong La Nino. So I'm going to look at how fast it transitioned out of this state. And then the onset for the definition, we look at a sustained period above the climatology. Now the data set from seven islands, which include nine stations, so they're varying from 20 to 40 years of data. We have some data gaps, so years with missing days, we ignore those. Um, for the ENSO, we look at ONI. We'll discuss that further. So that data set is from 1950 to 2015. And NCEP, NCAR, reanalysis data will help with the composite that we have developed. Now, a simple count was done on the start dates. And then we determine an average. So we wanted to find out what was the average start date of the rainfall season per station. Then we found out where you had earlier starts and you had later starts. Then after that, we introduce these characterized value in Markov chain model. And now that made the system more robust. And we identify a pattern and build this probability model that we'll do in the future. Now, to look at ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. So this is the Pacific right here. And what ENSO is, it's just the warming or cooling, so above normal sea surface temperatures within the Pacific. The 2015 event, if you can pay attention right here, where you see red and yellow, that means it's getting warmer. Are you seeing there? Yeah, very good. So in response to this, locally, the then director of the WMO, World Meteorological Organization, said, what? I think there will be an El Nino. Then the director of the Meteorological Service in Jamaica said, wait. So that now means how much they're going to mash way up. Then before you know it, what Water Commission will say? Impact of drought will carry into next year. And who remember the lock offs? Yes, so the impact is evident. And before you know it, 2015 had some of the most extreme values. Now to get to it, so we're going to define a period of transition, pot, not cannabis, but a period of transition. Now, if we look at the months, September, October, November, to March, April, May, that would define a period of transition. So during this period for the last, from 1950 to 2015, you had, it was either leaving an El Nino state or leaving a La Nina state for all the years. It was only 10% of the time, well, approximately 8% of the time, you were actually entering a particular state. So for the 92%, you were leaving. So this was true for all, wait, I'm getting nervous, sorry. 
This was true for all the ONI values. So after we get the ONI, we then look at the rate of change. Going back to CXC days, who remember this formula? Y equal MX plus C. What is the gradient? Ah, so <laughs> we looked at the maximum value and then we look at the neutral state. So simple, look at the extreme value, what occurred, and then the lowest state. So when the sea surface temperatures would return to normal, and then we determine what? The rate of change. Now we took that and we put it in this table, very colorful. So where you see red means that you were transitioning fast out of an El Nino. Where you see brown, you're transitioning slow out of an El Nino. Blue, the darker blue, means that you are transitioning fast out of a La Nina. Light blue, slow out of a La Nina. Good? Is that going good? Say yes. Yes. So zero, or white, would represent going a neutral year. And then the 8% that we mentioned that you were going into the season. You weren't leaving. You were going in. So we don't need to worry about that. No. Defining the wet season onset date. Now, Jamaican or the Caribbean rainfall is erratic. So one day you can have zero, next day you have 200, next day you have five. So, in order for you to get a, a good understanding or appreciation for a pattern, we have to do averages. So, we do 10, 30, 60, 90 day average. But that couldn't just be it. So, then we looked at the first day this average rose above the climatology. That would be the start. But again, we couldn't just stop there. We looked at when this period was not followed by a period that was below um, the climatology was greater than the previous period. So it had to be a sustained period that was evident. And I'll go into that later. And also, it must be after March 31st, but before August 1st, which is day 90 and day 230. 13, well, 214 in a leap year. You can forget that. So, literature would have alluded to this would be the start of the first rain season, right? So, we're just looking at the point where the actual rainfall season rose above the climatology. And here, this is Antigua. For each horizontal slot, it represents a year. So, the blue would represent the rainfall season. So you notice you have different size, different length. You have different starting. So some start here. Well, down here start late. Down here start early. So you had late starts and you had early starts. So we wanted to find out what was the cause for this. Now, wherever you see blue, the blue bar represents early starts. And the red bar represents late start. So the top panel is the year after an El Nino event. So are you seeing more blue bars? Yes. So we had earlier starts to the rainfall season following an El Nino event. And for the La Nina, which is the bottom one, we had more late starts following a La Nina event. But this was for the 30-day average. But it was true for the 60-day, and it was true for the 90-day. So it held true. But we couldn't just come to the people and say, we have got count and say, this is the research. No, we have to make it more robust. So we introduced Markov chain model. Now, just a brief overview. All stations showed a similar pattern. All stations had more years with earlier start in response to El Nino, late in response to La Nina. And there was a spatial variance. So there are differences in islands, southernmost islands than northernmost islands. And the signal was more visible for La Nina phase. So this, as I pointed to earlier, was the average start. So you can see that some had later starts than some. So wait, let me go to Dominica. I like Dominica. <laughs> Good, five minutes. So the jagged line is the moving average. So that would represent the average rainfall, or the climatology for Dominica. The blue and green line would represent the modeled um, Markov chain for the rainfall for Dominica. Now, for when we introduce El Nino, did it introduce whether it's fast or it's slow? We wanted to find out if 
that would affect or move forward the chance of having rainfall. Yes, it did. So the red line, so this is day of year, and this is the probability of rain. So if, well, let me put it here. So this line now represents the average start date. So if the line rises above this horizontal line before, that means it's starting earlier. So like, oh, this one right here, yeah. So you can notice this red line reaches the horizontal line at an earlier point than the blue line. So yes, the signal was there, and the model represented that. But then we introduce the rate of change in the model. And the same thing we found out, that the earliest start, so the red line from the diagram, red, fastest transition, at the earliest start, followed by the orange or brown line, was next. But the latest starts were as a result of what? A preceding La Nina year. And this held true for all the stations that we looked at. Well, the vertical and the horizontal bar, I couldn't bother to put it down to these things. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it held true for all the stations going across. So we wanted even to confirm it based on the seasonal, the surface sea surface temperatures within the Caribbean. So we looked at um, average sea surface temperatures from April to August, just to see. And then we interject. So for the top panel, the one on the left would represent the five earliest start to the rainfall season. And the one on the left would represent the five latest start to the rainfall season. So then we noticed that you had warming. So we're going to see the green and the yellow. That would mean the sea surface temperature were warmer than normal. Over here, they were cooler than normal. So the sea surface temperatures also showed that kind of pattern for all the stations, again, that we investigated. So in conclusion, we characterize ENSO by rate of change. Then we define the wet season onset date, and also we mapped it spatially. So we see the spatial differences that existed. Also, we investigated the relationship with ENSO and found out that for earlier start, it was in response to a fast transition from ENSO and for late start from La Nina. And yeah, so we thought we, we intend to expand or extend this analysis for the entire Caribbean. We looked at the Eastern Caribbean, so we want to do it for the entire Caribbean now. We hope to do some attribution, basically explain the teleconnection of the atmospheric conditions and the sea surface temperature condition just to explain what would have happened and what would have caused this. Also, develop a model that could actually predict the start of the wet season onset and uh, the length of the season. We want to also investigate that and define an ending, the cessation, when it ends, and also do some attribution to that as well. So before I go, I want to do some big up. So you don't know, big up the Lord God Almighty. Dr. Stevenson from Taylor, uh, CIMH, Med Service, and we got the two stars about this at night time. But that is it. Thank you very much. Currently in a well La Nina, but some there are some scientists are saying we're going into a double dip. So we're expecting to go back into a La Nina year. Um, so yeah, <laughs> so we can expect a late start based on the the, the research thus far. No, I'm not. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I 
I, I would agree with you, sir. No, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Let us thank Mr. Grant quickly. <laughs> I better take the mic quickly, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Mr. Grant, for a very interesting and entertaining presentation. Our next paper, Past, Present, Persistent, an Evaluation of Caribbean Drought and Its Drivers. We're going to invite Rochelle Walters to present. So we're turning our attention to climate extremes. Of a high, but okay. Fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, my research is drought, basically. Drought. So we're looking at drought. Remember, drought. So, drought, according to the American Meteorological Society, is an abnormal and prolonged precipitation deficit, which is the most vaguest thing you could ever use to define anything in science. Because abnormal and prolonged and deficit is all very subjective and very qualitative. So in climate, we use indices to help quantify these things. So they have multiple, as you can see up there, we have multiple indices we use. I will be using the SPI. Um, it's quantitative. And it's very region specific. And um, these styles and percent of normal aren't as region specific. The Palmer Drought Severity Index and the SPEI are region specific. However, they use, like Palmer, the PDSI uses about 40 different variables, which Jamaica doesn't have at the moment. And the SPEI has, uses evapotranspiration, which we kind of have, but not as much as precipitation. So. The major objectives are to apply the SPI as a drought index for Jamaica and the Caribbean. We're going to determine trends and patterns in our historical droughts, and we're going to use this index to determine possible causes for droughts in Jamaica and the Caribbean. Possible. Possible. It's not, there's nothing concrete, just possible. Okay, so this is what precipitation in Jamaica looks like according to the Met Service from 1881 to 2009. It's, it's a lovely graph, but apparently I'm the only one that fully appreciates it. So this is our climatology. As Kim said earlier, it's the monthly mean. So across the island, you see, we have a high in May and a high in October, a low in July, and a low in the early part of the year. And then we have our beautiful wavelet that talks about periodicities. So the wavelet talks about how cyclical our precipitation is. So the red is very strongly cyclical, and these dotted lines represent the statistically significant areas of cyclicality. OK. <laughs> so you see, these beautiful lines here show that we have a 13 to 21 year cyclicality running through our rainfall, and up here is the occasional two to six year periodicities um, in our rainfall. So now we're jumping into the SPI. So the basis of the SPI is that from one to minus one, from here to here is average rainfall. Anything above one is really wet, and everything below minus one is really dry. So basically, we're looking at the negative section because we're focusing on drought. Okay, so just look down here. You don't need to worry about up there. So this is the S this is the wavelet of the same SPI. You see, it's even prettier with all the red. So 
Um, you see, it's an even stronger 13 to 21 year cycle. So this is suggesting that our drought cycles through a 13 to 21 year cycle. And it also has a, um, also has a really strong three to six year in the early 1900s, in the 1970s, and in the 2000s. See that? All of these pretty cycles suggest that there is something driving our drought. And so we looked at our large scale oscillations, which are representations of recurring climate signals. And they're usually based on sea surface temperatures, sea level pressures, wind speeds, or some combination of two or three. As Sheldon showed earlier with the ENSO, since ENSO is one of the LSOs that we're looking at. And you can see on this diagram, most of our LSOs that we focus on but we, since we're here, we're only going to focus on these four. Well, I only focus on these four, but I'm not going to go through all of this because this gets really boring quickly. So in comparison, so this is our SPI 12, and this is our El Nino years for Jamaica. The red dots are the El Nino years. And you can see, it's not as easy to see, but there is a drop after most of the red dots, suggesting, which is not, anyway, yeah, okay, that's right. Yeah, just, just note that. But that's just Jamaica on a whole. We also looked on Jamaica on stations, which, which, which got really exciting, because then we did a clustering to see which stations were connected to each other. And we saw that our coastline is basically one big cluster and our mountainous regions is another cluster. Portland here is a cluster on its own, and the west just like just doing its own thing. So I'll show you how they're, only, how they're doing their own stuff. So this green line here is Portland, the climatology for Portland stations. It's just like, yeah, all on its own, doing its own thing. And the rest, the other three are kind of in sync, but the western one, which is this red one, is higher than the other two, which is the mountainous one, here, the dark blue, and the light blue is the coast. So you can see that our coastal regions just generally have less rain than everybody else. So this is our SPI 12, which is the prettiest diagram ever. You see it? You see it? This is my... Okay. All right. So these are SPI, the El Nino years. And you can see that... Um, yeah, it's hard to see on this, but... The El Nino years are the red lines going down, and then these are the same zones as before. So Portland is this green one, and it, it, it's just really doing its own thing. Just, it's like almost not affected by El Nino, based on this, based on all the correlations we did. But we did compare it to another um, oscillation, which is PDO, which is a blue line. So the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, you can see it's almost like a smoothing of the, of the, of the the zone. See? Almost like a trend line, but it's not, it's the PDO. So the assumption is then that zone that the Portland zone is driven more by the Pacific Decadal Oscillation than by El Nino. I think I have like five minutes, so we're going to speed this up. So this is the Caribbean data set that I took that we got from Declim. It's a nineteen fifty two thousand data set. And we clustered it like we did the stations. But these two zones here, this is zone two and zone eight, we just merged because it was basically the same thing. Just, yeah, close. And as you can see here, so this is zone three, this is zone four, and this is zone nine. So Trinidad and Tobago is in zone nine. I'm asking you to notice that Trinidad and Tobago is in zone nine because that's what we're gonna be looking at, zone nine. But in the look on the climatologies, this is zone nine, this is purple line. It's also doing its own thing, which is partly why we're looking at it. But the others kind of are similar. So what I showed you before is gonna hold strain for these ones. So we're gonna focus on zone nine because it's different and more interesting. But just, just so you see all of the SPIs together, you can see that they're all doing different things at different times. They 
this, this is to show that you can't treat the Caribbean as a whole because everybody is doing its own thing. So if you treat it like a whole, you're going to miss out on a lot of variability. So this is zone nine. It's very pretty. And this is zone nine with the El Nino, which you can say has nothing to do. So this is a correlation table. And the AMO is strongly correlated with zone four, which is Eastern Caribbean. But if you look on zone nine, zone nine not correlated with anything really. Because the, the bold is the statistically significant. And the only statistically significant thing is this point one one. So, so zone nine is really just not affected by these four. But we'll continue looking on it anyway. So we ended up doing a future thing, future test of the SPI, using Precy, which Jay is going to talk about later. And in it, we see here, we're looking at the minus one, we see here where it progressively gets drier according to this model. Yeah, so it progressively gets drier. So this is just to suggest that, as was said before, we're going into hotter and drier, and it's proven in, even in the SPI. And we see in here the percentage of time spent in drought between 2020 and 2070, according to this one model. Trinidad is just going to be like always dry. The rest of us might have hope, but <laughs> Trinidad just so anyway, <laughs> in conclusion, drought is a serious issue for the Caribbean, and it is potentially predictable, but the characteristics are changing, and the future drought is potentially going to be very severe for the Caribbean. So in that point, water management is going to be important, data is going to be important, but we need to stop treating the Caribbean and Jama even Jamaica as one line, one time series, we need to take into account the different areas. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rochelle. Any questions for Rochelle? Yes, sir. depends on where we're looking, but generally there's 13 years that are lower than the next 13 years. Okay, any other question? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Not a like? Yes. The low minus one on the SPI scale is dry. <laughs> <laughs> Explain that to our policy maker. <laughs> All right, any other question? Oh, one. Um, you, you mentioned in the beginning, thank you very much, nice presentation. You mentioned in the beginning that there are other indices out there, and uh, one of the main differences is that they include the temperature effect as well, right? Um, how would your future projections change uh, for the Caribbean as a whole, or what would be your guess if you would use indices that also account for changes in evapotranspiration? When I didn't do it with the SPA, but mm -hmm. other people have done it, and it generally pr predicts even drier than what the SPI does. So it's yeah. just drier, mm -hmm. worse. And, and how would it affect some of your conclusions? Uh, about which islands are seeing a stronger drying, drying trends and which don't, if you w would include or compare your results with effects that have a temperature. Oh, well, I'd probably look more at the Eastern Caribbean because the Eastern Caribbean has a, um, a more spotty water supply. So they'd, they'd probably have the hardest time with it coping. Okay, thanks. 
Can we put our hands together for Rochelle? We're going to get, forgive me, we're going to move and get a glimpse of future climate. And so we're going to have a paper that looks at imminent, distant, or unlikely evaluating Paris Accord thresholds for the Caribbean from a high-resolution regional climate model ensemble. I'm going to invite Jacka Campbell to present this paper. I will try my best to keep the trend going. Thank you, Sheldon. Thank you, Rochelle. I will try my best to keep it going. Good day. I'm here to present imminent, distant, or likely. Evaluating the Paris Accord um, thresholds for the Caribbean from a high resolution regional climate model and so on. I'm going to try my best to keep it as simple as possible, and I'm going to try my best to stick to 10 minutes. So in so doing, I have actually done this presentation in 10 slides. So you can count me down. Note the corner, right in the corner, you will see 2 of 10. So I will not be up here that long. All right. So we talk about the Paris Accord thresholds. There are a few things you must consider, right? It's an agreement, the latest attempt at strengthening what is deemed to be a global response to climate change. And it actually says that any country that ratifies the treaty seek to um, stem greenhouse gas emissions um, for the coming century with the goal of doing so as soon as possible, um, getting them to peak as soon as possible and thereafter reducing to the end of the century. For my presentation, the key things you're going to note is that the, 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 it sets out that at the end of the century it should be no more than two degrees with an ideal of it to 1.5. So the key things you're going to be noting is two degrees and 1.5 degrees. All right? But why is this important for the Caribbean? You've heard about sensitivity from Prof. Taylor's talk. You've heard about um, biodiversity from Kim's talk. You've heard about drought from Rochelle's talk. Why is that all important? It's important because almost every single sector for economic viability within the region is climate sensitive. If you think about agriculture, you think about tourism, you think about health, you think about energy, it's all linked to climate. So with that in mind, we have to keep climate at the forefront of our minds. Additionally, we would also take into account the statement that if you look at the 10 most disaster prone countries in the world within that 10 Caribbean has six countries within that top 10 if you extend it to the top 50 all the Caribbean nations are found within the top 50 most disaster prone countries which means that we need to take a focus on the Caribbean added to that is that if you examine two of the most two of those climate sensitive sectors I mentioned before they contribute between 25 35% to the region's GDP, which means that any changes, any disaster with that is related or affects them can actually um, be of utter significance to the region, right? And a bit of context, the 1.5 versus 2 degrees, the globe had set this target that, you know, 2 degrees to, to, is, is where it should be at, at the end of the century. And when we talk about 2 degrees, we're talking about two degrees when compared to pre-industrial levels. That pre-industrial level we're talking about is the period from 1860 to about 1900. So two degrees of that period, right? But the small islands agreed that two was too much, right? And as you saw, they said it needed 1.5 to stay alive. Now, needing 1.5 to stay alive, what does it mean for the and attempts have been made to quantify what that 1.5 means, but that has been done using a GCM. And that has been done by Taylor et al. 2017. And the rest of it that's there is all an attempt of quantifying 
what happens for the region, what is expected change for the region. So you have Karmalkar 2013-2010, Campbell et al. 2011, and Centia um, 2008. These are some of the papers that have been done to actually kind of give out for a projection of what is possible within the Caribbean. Additionally, they all use a single realization of a either downscaling a GCM, and by GCM I'm talking about a global climate model. I'm using something, the easiest way to think about this difference is this. An RCM is kind of like a 20 megapixel camera. It gets a whole lot of detail compared to a GCM, which would be a 0.5 megapixel camera. Not much detail. An island at Jamaica within a GCM is expressed in four grid boxes, which means everywhere within that grid box has the same value. Compare that to an RCM or a regional climate model where Jamaica is now divided up into approximately at a 25 km resolution 40 grid boxes which means that now you can separate parishes you can separate east from west north from south so it gives you a greater degree of detail which is why for our context that limit that improvement is very important right so there are two main ways of actually filling in the gaps that have been um, left out by these um, previous studies. One, remember, the study used a GCM. And not another is that they all use a single realization of an RCM or a single downscaling of a GCM. All right? So there are two main ways in which we can ascribe some confidence. We can take the multi-model uh, um, ensemble approach or we can use the perturbed physics. The multi-model ensemble approach requires us to take multiple models, install those multiple models, and take the same realization and run those realizations through multiple models. Right? Whereas the perturbed physics, which we are interested in, basically you take the same model and you tweak it. Right? Let's say you can determine the rate of rise of a parcel of air because everything with the atmosphere is, can be expressed using physics equations. So you, if, you, if you can determine the rate of rise or perturb the rate of rise or perturb or change when it is that rainfall occurs, at what point in time do you get rainfall? Each one of the, is each time you change something, it constitutes a perturbation, right? It has its strengths, it has its weaknesses. Um, but the weakness here is, doesn't actually cripple what it is that we're trying to do, does not affect what we're trying to do. Because what we're trying to do um, is actually try to systematically, by, by systematically sampling the model uncertainty to actually describe or get to a point of ascribing some degree of confidence. All right? PRACI, you've heard about it before. PRACI simply stands for Providing Regional Climates for Impact Studies. It's a model that was designed by the UK Hadley Met, Met, Met Service. It has a maximum possible resolution of 25 km. It's natu it accounts for natural variability and also has vari variations in future emissions. Um, in this instance, a model was driven by the quantifying uncertainty in model projections or the COMP model, which is a 17-member ensemble. And it is, it is a scenario realization of the SRES, which is a special remote report on emission scenarios. And to think about it, you simply think, look at my future state. What is my population going to be like? You can tweak your population up or down. If your population increases, then you can say, if everything else remains the same, then they require more energy, more other things, and so your emissions go up. And once your emissions go up, then you're actually contributing more to the thing that changes climate. So when we speak about SRES A1B, we're simply saying we're taking that particular storyline. And whatever that storyline is, it's equivalent in this instance to an RCP 0.5 that you saw Dr. Slushna um, have up earlier. All right? Um, key, very, very key. We are small islands. We have limited resources. And in, it, in the time it would take me to run all 17 of those realizations, this, it, it wouldn't be the 11th staging of this annual conference anymore. It'd probably be the 20th or the 30th staging of conference so we had to select a subset and in selecting a subset right we had to select a subset to downscale and in selecting a subset we selected a subset that would have covered the range of realizations without saying we selected only the ones that were high or only the ones that were lowered only ones that represented the mean state right we then selected those from the GCM 
After selecting those from the DGMs and subsetting those, we then conducted our modeling experiments. So we actually took that driving data and downscaled that driving data. We then evaluated for years when the globe is at 1.5 and 2 degrees. And I'll say more about how we established those 1.5 and 2 degrees years. And when we're talking about a baseline within the model, we're talking about 1960 to 1990. And any projected period we're talking about falls within the period 2020 to 2100. And for the rest of the presentation, the key two variables of interest would be precipitation and two meter temperature. At some points, you may see a wind diagram, but that's just to drive the point home. All right? So the scenario selection, this is from the GCM. All right? So all 17 are plotted. The top one is precipitation, and the bottom one is temperature. You heard Ms. Rochelle Waters speak about the bimodal pattern um, that existed um, within the region. And it's still there. We're taking an entire um, average of the entire domain. And here you can see that's the observed precipitation. And it's clear to see that immediately, if you're looking at this and you're going, well, the model doesn't do so well in the early parts of the, the year. It does better at the end of the year, the late season rainfall. But it doesn't do so well at the start. But no, we are not quite interested in matching up the values. We just want to see that it captures the overall pattern. Although not shown here, um, maps plotted spatially show that they do simulate the north-south gradient. Um, maxima and minima were correctly simulated in, as in the overall positions, and timing of the maxima was correctly simulated. And there are some clear over and under estimations in some areas. Right? Temporally, as you're looking at, you can see that temperature was more accurately simulated. The pattern of temperature tends to match, with some being a little bit below and some being above. All right? All right, looking at precip now, we're looking at some Taylor diagrams, and it's just showing you this is model versus observed. It's showing you that all the 17 realizations are not the same, and there's a spread. And we tried to come up with a metric of selection. And within that, we did the same thing for, for temperature. And then we came up with our subset. And here we're showing you this is actually a subset of mean, the ensemble mean. So you take all 17 perturbations. And then you take the selected. And in the selected, we only selected six of those. We only had this, the, the time and the resources that don't scale six. And what we did was we took the average of all 17 and the average of the six that we did. And then we subtracted it that from the ensemble mean. And here we have, this is temperature. And anywhere that, that is white is suggesting that that is between, you may not be able to see it clearly, that is between 0.2 and minus 0.2 of a degree. So the difference between the two things are minus 2 and minus 0.2 of a degree. All right? Looking at um, precipitation, the largest differences we saw was in the May, June, July um, season. However, that was over Central America. If you look at the Caribbean, the Central Caribbean Basin, all right, here, in all the diagrams, all right, right across, it shows a very, very good representation overall. So it leaves us with a confidence that, yes, the selection you made is seemingly okay. You can now take this, run this to your regional climate model, which takes months to give you results. So if you get it wrong, no, you can't fix it later. You have to go run it again. All right? So, projections. Now, how did we establish what is a 1.5 year and what is a 2 degree year? So, you take 1860 to 1900 and you average those. When you average those temperatures, you create a running mean of differences from that period onwards. So you take 1860 to 1900, and you minus it from average of 1900. And then you keep doing that for 10 years. You keep doing that until you get to a point where, guess what? The difference is 1.5. And the year after that, no year after that, does it fall below 1.5. Right? And that's for the globe. Did the same thing for 2 degrees. And then when you get the 1.5 year, we do not treat it as a single year. You take the four years before, five years before, five years after. That is what we treat as our 1.5 state. All right? And this is similar to the methodology that um, Taylor et al. 2017 did. All right? So 
in precipitation. You can see that areas of drying in the ensemble mean. So here we have an ensemble mean. This is taking all six of the ensemble members and actually averaging them. This is looking at where ensemble, the maximum. So any point where it was the maximum change across the ensemble, that's what you have right there. And then the ensemble minimum. Looking at the 1.5 years, you realize that relative anywhere in white suggests negligible change. So negligible change. In, even in the ensemble max at 1.5, it's even suggesting that we could possibly get wetter. Right? The key thing to note is that whereas you see limited or no red in this one, you come down to 2 degrees and that's a change in sign. So it's suggesting that the difference between 1.5 and 2 could very well be a change in projected sign of rainfall that we're expected to get. So instead of an increase in rainfall, we may very well end up getting change in increase would be <laughs> All right. All right. The greatest extent, the greater extent of drying is in, the, in is in the southern Caribbean at two point uh, at a two degree mark, and you can see that a change of sign over windward islands in a 1.5 versus two um, extreme. At temperatures, please note the globe being at 1.5 does not mean that the Caribbean is at 1.5. The globe being at two degrees does not mean that the Caribbean is necessarily at two degrees. And start from this map, the key thing I note is that the globe being having a difference of 0.5 degrees does not mean that the difference for the Caribbean is 0.5 degrees. Right? So, on some minimum, there's also a change in sign of the, over the lesser Antilles again for the ensemble um, in the ensemble minimum. Right? And warming of the oceans exceeds the two degrees for the nor northern Caribbean. So the warming over the northern Caribbean exceeds the global two degrees warming over the ocean. All right? Projections. So what we did was actually look at the 2050s. So this is no longer 1.5 versus 2. It's just saying, what would be my state in the 2050s? What would be my state in the 2090s? And by 2050, I'm taking 2040. To 2060 by 2090s I'm taking 2080 to 2100 and creating an average state and that comes and co comes out as your climatology <laughs> all right so this is precip temp and wind and you can see that as you progress all right the extent of drying that you you are experiencing extends further ju not just within this not just of the, the coast of Central America but all the way to the Southern Caribbean and up into the, 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 the Lesser Antilles. All right? And as my time is running out, I'm going to conclude here. Um, I'm going to say that there is a high confidence that, the, that as the world exceeds 1.5 um, and approaches 2, the Caribbean will experience between 25 to 50 percent um, re reduction in rainfall. The difference between a glo the globe being at 1.5 and 2 um, exceeds a 0.5 difference um, in temperature for the Caribbean. And whereas, you know, whereas at 1.5 the Caribbean is projected to have increases in precipitation at ensemble max, this decrease and a decrease in ensemble min at 2 degrees, all projections across the ensemble show decreases. And my final slide is to say thank you to my funding all right, partners, um, the PPCR project. Um, Inter-American Development Bank, Climate Investment Fund, and of course you for providing me with space to work. Uh, and with that I say thank you. Thank you so much, Jerka. We can take a question or two. Is that okay. clear? All right, we're uh, going to move on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank you, Jay. Great, great presentation. I was, I was just thinking we had this other presentation before uh, about rainy season length and the characteristics of this, and and uh, particularly the importance for the uh, windward islands or for rainy season lengths for windward islands. Uh, so I was wondering if if 
the NCAU modeling work would also allow you to look at rainy season characteristics in the future? Um, sure, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Sheldon uses daily data. We provide him with daily data and he, he can do all that analysis. So I'm, the model does output daily and sub-daily data so that analysis can be done as the onset periods should they shift uh, and stuff like that. together for Mr. Jackson. All right, we're heading into our final presentation. A slight shift, but still related to climate. We can talk about it on the mitigation, reducing greenhouse gases side of things. And so we're turning our attention to renewable energy, and we're going to have a paper that looks at realization of a universal low-cost remote monitoring system for commercial photovoltaic energy systems application in the Caribbean. Yakini Wallenbrand will present. Ladies and gentlemen, could we welcome Yakini? All right, um, hi everybody. Like um, Dr. Stevenson introduced me, my name is Yakini Wallen Bryan, and as she also said, my presentation or my paper is not necessarily so much about um, climate awareness or um, climate predictions, but more so on the side of climate mitigation. And the f area that I'm focusing on is renewables, and particularly solar energy. And the ambiguity is that people tend to associate with having a solar energy system. Um, so I'm just going to get right into it. I won't keep you guys here too long. Um, so a bit of a background, if you don't already know, solar photovoltaic cells, photovoltaic cells basically just convert energy in the form of solar insulation or radi irradiance, radiation, into electrical energy or current and voltage electrons flowing through a wire or a conductor. Um, the output from a solar cell across a load when sunlight is incident is a DC voltage and current. So as you know, um, generators typically, like AC generators that um, require a turbine, produce AC power, solar panels produce DC power. Um, if you're not so sure what difference is, I'm just going to say this is a straight line, AC is up and down. That's all I'm going to say. I won't give you much more context on that. Um, so there are different types of solar energy systems. The three common types are grid tied with a battery, grid tied without a battery, and standalone systems. Grid tied with battery systems are simply comprised of a solar array feeding into a charge controller and or inverter. The charge controller charges the battery bank and collects charge from the battery bank. Um, the inverter simply converts that DC power into AC power, the same up and down that I mentioned before, and that's what we use in um, our plugs, and that's what runs on our power lines. So the inverter converts it into what we would consider usable energy. That's not the best way to phrase it, but basically energy that we can plug into our wall and use. And also a grid-tied system implies that the inverter feeds some of the energy back to the grid. Another common system is grid-tied without a battery, so you can still feed energy back to the grid, but without storing any energy. So it's the same thing as before, just without a charge controller and without a battery. And then you have standalone systems, and this is where you don't really care about JPS that much, and you're just generating all energy and keeping it for yourself. So this is where you have the everything as before, but instead of the inverter feeding it back to the grid, you know, you're, you're, you're storing all that energy, or you're using it up in your own local um, s setup. So um, a couple of things or challenges that we tend to face with solar PV systems, and the main one is that they're entirely dependent on environmental conditions. The two main ones being solar insulation and temperature. Um, variability in solar insulation can manifest itself um, through cloud cover, um, seasonal variability, shading, meaning something like a tree blocking a solar panel. Solar variability, meaning the sun itself actually varies in intensity throughout the course of a year or course of a century. Um, as well as atmospheric composition, if there's more dust particles in the air, we have less um, sunlight or radiation coming in. And temperature can manifest itself both from direct solar radiation, diffuse radiation, and that's when the sun heats up the surface and re the surface re-radiates heat um, back into the atmosphere. And wind speed is, again, wind speed and convection are the two things that can either cool a system down, or if there's a lack of wind speed, there's a lack of convection currents, and then the system can get really hot. Um, so unfortunately, sometimes people can consider PV energy systems to be unreliable. Um, sorry, unpredictable is a more accurate word to use. Um, 
So yeah, owners of energy, solar energy systems can sometimes live in a black box of ambiguity in the sense that you know, it could be off-site and let's say there's a storm coming in or just unusually um, high amounts of cloud cover and the system is performing lower than it should. And this system, for some reason, um, you're using it to power um, like a server or something really important. Now, really and truly, if you have an expensive and thoroughly designed enough system, you should never have this big of an issue because you're designed for some degree of autonomy. This just means that under worst, worst case scenarios, your system should still be up and running. However, not all of us have a big bank. Not all of us can afford. And by big bank, I mean both financial bank and battery bank because the battery is really what determines um, how long your system will last. And batteries are also one of the more expensive parts of a system. So, um, yeah, so sometimes people have a bit of difficulty monitoring these things. Um, and there are some existing available remedies. There are some inverters with some monitoring features. However, they can be costly to implement, um, especially since an inverter is a part of the big initial capital investment that people usually get back when investing in a solar PV system. Um, if you're going to retrofit an inverter just to simply get that remote monitoring capability, you're going to be disregarding a lot of initial invested capital, which can be pretty costly. Um, and oftentimes, these inverters do don't provide any environmental variables that come along with this um, electrical like um, information, meaning power, which is current and voltage. Another way you can do it is manually measure the weather conditions and electrical um, system performance at the same time. But this is very, 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 very labor intensive, very tedious, and I would commend anybody that would take up such a challenge. But it's, it's, it's a very long process if you want to do this properly. Um, so the solution that me and my supervisors are proposing is a universal low-cost remote monitoring system. Universal implying that it's compatible with most commercially available photovoltaic systems um, in the Caribbean region. Low-cost meaning it's designed with hardware and software to minimize the cost of production and maintenance. And remote monitoring means that the data that is generated from or collected from the system can be harnessed remotely from an off-site location. So how the system would be implemented, is there a laser pointer on this? Yes, there's a laser pointer. All right, how the system would be implemented, it, it comprises of three main sections. There's a section that you put at the site of the array, which is this red box here. This would monitor both the incoming solar irradiance and the temperature of the module. This um, little antenna here means that it, com it wirelessly communicates this information to wherever you have your um, charge controller or your electrical setup, your, your power room or whatever some people like to call it. Here are these green boxes, these are collecting current and voltage data, which gives you power energy if you did level one physics, if you, if you didn't, I'm letting you know. Um, and as you can see, it's compatible with the three main types of um, solar energy systems, whether it be standalone, grid tied, or, sorry, standalone, grid tied, and grid tied with a battery bank. And all this information, of course, will be wirelessly communicated to a online web page that you'll be able to access from any location once you have internet. Um, I won't bore you with my motivation. So selection of measurement parameters. <laughs> the two main environmental parameters, like I mentioned before, that affect PV performance are temperature and solar insulation. Um, so this first graph here, just so you can see bigger temperature, as you have an increase in temperature, you have a decrease in output voltage. Um, so while temperature kind of does increase the output current of a a module by a small amount, the output voltage decreases significantly. This red line is a higher temperature cell. This blue line is a lower temperature. So as you can see, the current increases slightly, but the voltage drops significantly, and this leads to an overall loss in power, power being the product of both voltage and current. So overall, temperature has a negative, high temperatures have a negative effect on solar PV performance. Solar irradiance, um, a decrease in solar irradiance Less sunlight you have, less solar irradiance you have, the less current your module will be producing, and then henceforth less power. So um, I put all of these words in context. Therefore, if you if you were if you were able to collect both the um, weather data along with the system's electrical performance, it's possible to predict if um, the system is installed long enough, what the um, possible energy yields would be or system efficiency would be under certain weather conditions. Um, and this simultaneously be able to size the system accordingly and manage your loads accordingly. Um, so by pulling weather forecast data from the internet and doing a correlation analysis over a period of time, it is possible for the system to predict an estimate of what the performance of a PV system will be based on previously collected data and algorithms that I would use in the system. 
So of course, this would yield increased user and investor confidence in PV technologies. So the, just to give you a bit of an overview or a recap, just to make things a bit clear, the electrical parameters that the system will be measuring are current and voltage. The meteorological parameters are the incident solar irradiance and ambient temperature. And from these, you can derive the array output power, your array output energy, and your module temperature. And these are just some equations if you um, want to go back to your roots and some physics. Um, this is just telling you how we get power. This is telling you how we get energy. Power, as I mentioned before, is just current and voltage. Energy is power um, times time. And the module temperature can actually be inferred from the ambient temperature using this um, equation here. Um, I'm trying my best to not have to use um, this equation at all and design a, a system that can clip onto the back of a module and just tell me the module temperature instead of having to infer it because um, several reports have um, basically stated some inconsistencies with this equation here. But all this feels, this is what I'll be using. Um, and then the user interface, of course, you know, if you don't have access to internet at the moment, this is what the user interface would look like. It's just a regular um, display with buttons, and this would be displaying these pieces of information. Um, and of course, the web-based interface, as I mentioned before, um, you'll be able to log in, sign into your account, uh, or log in, as I said before, look at the system performance from anywhere once you have an internet connection. Um, so basically, where I'm at right now um, is component testing. By next month, I should have built a system and installed it at physics here. And it's just a matter of um, finishing testing the enclosed system, writing my thesis, and submitting my thesis. So in conclusion, uh, I just hope to meet my objectives ahead of schedule and submit my thesis for review. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yakini. Any questions for Yakini? Any investors for Yakini? <laughs> just checking, just checking. All right, thank you so much, Yakini. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, before you leave, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to just allow me five minutes. So we want to thank all of our presenters. Could we put our hands together for all our presenters? You did an excellent job. You did us proud. We'd also like to acknowledge again our sponsors for the session, this, the climate change session that is running throughout this day. Um, our, the Caribbean Development Bank, please join me in thanking our sponsors for this session. We want to acknowledge and just just give me the five minutes. We want to acknowledge a number of our other sponsors. We have a representative of the Inter-American Development Bank here. Anaiti, thanks for joining us and thanks, thank you for the sponsorship. So we have Jamaica National Group Limited, the U.S. School of Graduate Studies and Research, the Port Authority of Jamaica, Grace Kennedy Foundation, National Bakery Company Limited, we have been enjoying their products on the outside. With Cinco, we have been enjoying their products. Perishables Jamaica Limited, we have been enjoying their products. Face a Commodity Company Limited, we have been enjoying their products. Let's put our hands together for the sponsors. We're highlighting our sponsors because one of our sponsors has sent this lovely gift basket that we can give to one of you who have stuck around with us for today. I will give it to the person who can tell me. In Jayaka's presentation, he likened the camera and two types of models. So he talked about two kinds of cameras versus two kinds of models. Anybody who can tell me what is the comparison? I see Candice's hand going up. Should physics be disqualified? Yeah. OK, the next hand. The next hand. Okay, miss, could you just stand up and speak loudly? All right, but... Good. All right, you're getting closer. He likened them to the camera. Global climate model was like, what kind of camera, regional climate model? The basket is calling you. Take your time. Yes. 
Say, prof helping you, prof helping you. See them helping you. 20 megapixel, yes. You're getting closer. Put your hands together. Come down for your gift basket. From Facey Commodity Company Limited. Keep on clapping her, ladies and gentlemen. You want to give us a flip the switch for us? And we're going to invite another sponsor just to do the presentation. <laughs> All about our sponsors. And I see you want to just come and just hand this door for us? On behalf of another sponsor, I, I know they won't. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't have a basket, but I have to tell you that if your research goes very well, we will be happy to invest <laughs> and find us. <laughs> And we have it on camera. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much and well done. All right, some housekeeping for us, ladies and gentlemen. So we're moving into our poster session. It lasts until 6 p.m. There are mixed displays on the outside. You can walk, interact with presenters and those who are leading the demonstrations. At 6 o'clock, we're going to have our public forum. It will not be in this room, but it will be by the Undercroft. If you do not know where the Undercroft is, we have ushers on the outside who will help you to find the Undercroft. It's, near, it's next to our administrative section of the university. All right, ushers are around to help you find the Undercroft. So we'll have that public forum. We'll have, as you can see on the program, we'll be talking about effectively communicating science. We'll have a presentation. We'll have a panel discussion. You don't want to miss this. We'll also have the launch of the Caribbean 1.5 publication series. After this, we're going to go into our conference reception. Yes, you have been working hard. We want to, you to have some fun and alumni soiree. All right, it's our conference reception, and all the alumni will also be at this reception, and we're going to celebrate the 70 years we have existed as a faculty. Just to say tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, we invite you back for 9 a.m. Please come back and, and, and stick with us. We're going to be talking about the latest in PV in photovoltaic, solar technology, opportunities and challenges. We have one more keynote coming in to do this, this presentation. And we are then going to move into our business leaders panel discussion. And the day will only get better with the grand innovation challenge. It's a day you can't afford to miss. Not to mention the awards at the end of that. All right? You can't afford to miss it. All right? So please come back, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy the break. Enjoy the demos. And then we all head to the Undercroft. Thank you so much. next tomorrow and remember tomorrow we'll be in slt3 all right it will be in slt3 right here thank you ladies and gentlemen <laughs>